Mega Man, Jimmy Easy. Come on. Welcome to Advocacy Help Desk, a network of advocacy leaders sharing best practices and new ideas via this free podcast to help everyone in government affairs get better at their advocacy craft and having a lot of fun while doing it. Now to today's great show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Advocacy Help Desk. As you know, at the front end, our script tells it all, but I'll remind you, we're a network. We're a network of advocacy innovators and practitioners. We've been doing this a long, long time. This show is about bringing on diverse voices from across the advocacy industry and the profession to talk about how they see changes happening, how they're adapting uh, during the you know continuation of COVID, even after COVID, as we start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, what they're thinking about, their strategies, and as I said before on previous shows, it's, this show is it's a free show, so tell all your friends about it. But it's really iron sharpening iron, strengthening everybody, helping everybody pull up a little bit better, and having a hell of a lot of fun while doing it. So um, this will be a really interesting show because some of you may say, "I thought I was listening to the help desk, and really I felt like I was listening to a bunch of guys sitting around at happy hour chatting." And that is true. We've had a lot of practice at this. So, Fracken, who is around the uh, the bar with this uh, for this discussion? Well, Mr. Polk, first of all, it is good to have you back on. Thank we have had a co-host recently. It is always great to see you and to have you join us. Uh, and for me not to be the lead host is always right. nice um, and probably better for our listeners. Uh, today, uh, so great to see you. Today, we have the one and only Michael Calvo, who is, as I have it here, Head of Federal Government Relations and Advocacy at GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, Michael, it is great to see you. Uh, great to have you on. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am fascinated by today's show uh, just for two seconds plugs here of um, we've been doing a lot of talking to association members and we love association members, but we've also gotten a lot of questions lately about, hey, can you talk to more corporations? Can you talk to more people who are more directly involved in my day to day rather than this association or nonprofit side? And so today we have exactly that. We have somebody who is head of federal, you know, head of federal and government relations and advocacy and just in it in the corporation side and understanding it. So we're going to dive into a lot of the topics that we may have spoken about before on association land, um, but in this case, in corporation world and such. So with that, uh, welcome, Michael. Hi, Friday, uh, Paul. Uh, thank you guys so much for, or Brian and Andy, sorry, uh, so much for, <laughs> Not a problem. for having me. Uh, I mean, Andy, you said it was like a happy hour and around a bar, so we can just uh, chat casually. Let's keep it honest. We we'll yeah, keep uh, it honest on this show. That's fine. Uh, oh. Appreciate you guys having me. Um, really uh, pleased to be here and talk about what's going on in the corporate side of things and how we're engaging. Uh, let's, uh, let's kick things off really quickly, Michael. Can you tell folks, um, sort of, we always like to hear from folks, part of what we do is career advancement. We talk about that all the time. Um, can you just give us a two-second background on sort of how you got started and where you are today. Uh, so yeah, 13 years uh, on Capitol Hill, all on the house side. Uh, I know. Um, and then for uh, about the last four and a half, almost five years now, uh, in-house at GSK. Wow. Five years at GSK. I did not know that. Jeez, that's fantastic. Congratulations. So uh, Mr. Polk, where would you like to start today? Well, first, I think it's really interesting just to hear from Michael about their advocacy around COVID. I mean, we're, you know, first of all, we want to let people know that there's been a hell of a lot of great work done by pharma and GSK and a lot of great, you know, sometimes they take a hit, um, but honestly, without their innovation and without the infusion of capital and know-how, we wouldn't be, we'd be looking down a three-year fix for COVID um, instead of less than a year, which is amazing. So um, first of all, just day-to-day -day GSK, what's the company, what are you guys working on, especially around COVID these days? And we've got a uh, thanks, Andy. We've done a number of things in the, the vaccine space as far as collaborations to try to uh, work with um, other companies using our our adjuvanted our adjuvant ASO three uh, to help be a, a force multiplier uh, in vaccines. We're still waiting uh, for some of those uh, collaborations to come to fruition. Uh, we're also working on monoclonal antibodies uh, on the therapeutic side. A couple of collaborations there, waiting for data to uh, read out uh, from some of the clinical trials. So. Uh, we're hopeful for a very good year that we can be part of, of the solution uh, and help, you know, as we say, help patients uh, do more, live longer, uh, do more, feel better and live longer. And how, yeah. how has that worked around? Like, obviously, when COVID hit and everybody's freaking out and they start turning to pharma. So you got, you know, 
all the executive agencies, members of Congress coming to you guys. So, you know, it's kind of reverse advocacy where you have to usually fight to get time. They're all coming to you and start talking to you. How do you, how have you guys managed that process? It sounds like you're having to work more closely with uh, competitors that are in the marketplace, but like similar right now around government relations side, how have you guys worked across different companies and communicated to members? Uh, really technical stuff. How have you, you educated and staffed them up on that? And I think it's a good, also a good question. I think we've been working really primarily at the outset of, you know, here's what we're trying to do from a scientific perspective, mm -hmm. um, whether it be vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, you know, across the board within the life sciences of, you know, how can we be a resource, uh, particularly for members of Congress where there's footprints, how can we be a resource for you guys so that as you're talking to the administration, as you're talking to executive uh, branch officials, where we can, you know, help you have the understanding and information for the right conversations. Right. Uh, at the outset, a lot of it, you know, if you guys remember 11 months ago, which now seems like five, six years ago, I mean, there was such a rush in demand on a lot of prescriptions. Um, so, you know, the first in the CARES Act, when you started seeing 60, 90 day scripts being filled, um, if it weren't for, you know, a robust global supply chain, you know, I, it would have been much more difficult to meet the demand uh, for the patients at the time. Uh, and so we were having to communicate that as well to elected officials, both within in the then Trump administration and on Capitol Hill. So, and just so you know, Michael, Andy does a lot of the larger questions and I do a lot of the nitty gritty, <laughs> detailed bullet point questions. So um, coming back to what you just said about how we can be a resource or how can we be a resource? Do you have any advice uh, from what you've seen both on the Hill side and now from the corporate side for folks who are in these corporate jobs may not be at somebody who gets turned to immediately as number one, but can try to get themselves in the door as being that resource for staffers who, when something like this hits on any scale, can be there for them? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's largely due to a lot of the relationship building. And it's just, okay. if you look at what we have done you know, from our lobbying perspective uh, at GSK, you know, a lot of our champions who we've been working with, the ones that understand our company, that know where our footprint is and, and how we're uh, helping patient outcomes, you know, we were getting a lot of questions from the Hill. And I think that's, you know, that's not just something you do over a, a two or three month period. That's something you spend a lot of time doing. So, you know, I guess my, my um, suggestion would be is that, you know, keep in touch with your Hill contacts to make sure that they always see you as being a value add uh, so that when these situations arise, they can simply, they have the ability to come to you with these questions. And so, so something there would just be start small, start with anything, just be there for them so that when something happens, right? Don't think you need to come out of the gate with something huge, just start small with what you've got. Yeah. And quite frankly, oftentimes that begins, you know, you can have meetings with staff that, you know, from the outset to say, listen, I don't have an ask here. I just want to give you an update of what's going on. Sure. So that every meeting sure. you have doesn't necessarily have to result in a direct ask. Uh, and sometimes that does help build the relationship uh, with that staff and with that member. I like it. As so, staff, I mean, from a staff ahead. perspective, being there 13 years, Michael, uh, you know, when someone comes in and does that, does it shock you a little bit? Does it take you back? Because typically when you're sitting there, you're getting eight and 10 asks per meeting, which number one is way too many. I mean, if you're asking more than one or two things, it's really hard as a staffer to keep up with your one or two things plus the 20 other meetings you have during the day. So, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. When you talk about like relationship building from a staffer perspective, talk about it from that audience. Like, what are you looking for as a staffer? So how can I rely on somebody? So going back to my staff days. So if we think back now, 10 years ago, um, yeah, it was 10 years ago, uh, to the Fukushima Daiichi um, meltdown in Japan, sure. you know, working for a member of the Georgia delegation on energy and commerce, um, with an interest in nuclear power, you know, we had to be able to uh, talk about those certain sorts of things and had to put my boss at the time on camera to be prepared to talk about those mm -hmm. things. So, you know, the Southern company, Georgia Power, came to us and when I, at the time, covering the energy portfolio, just said, hey, how can, here's a, a bevy of information we have. How can we be helpful to you? Sure. Uh, and not just, hey, we need something from your boss to do. It was, you know, how can we as a company be helpful to you as a staffer. Uh, and that ends up building needed trust so that, um, you know, in good times and in bad, so you know that they can be relied on as a resource because they're proactively coming 
to be of assistance to you and your boss. I, I like it. I, I think that that's a great lesson for anybody is be prepared. And obviously, you know, we, we had Tommy Goodwin on earlier that says, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Right. And so it's, it's not, you're not nefarious in any way here. You're just saying, look, we want to be helpful for you. We are experts in this arena. Do you need this kind of information? We have it. Let's talk. Right. So we're in 2021. There's a fence around Capitol Hill right now. Sure. What are your ideas and, and, and how do we translate that conversation where it's no longer just walking up to an office and talking to somebody and spending two minutes or grabbing coffee with them, but there's a lot more going on. So, so let's start with some of the kickoff pieces here of just like it's 2021. What are some of the pieces that you're putting in place to ensure success? Um, from a lobbying and advocacy perspective, I think it's just you know, having a regular cadence with, you know, take your top 10 or 15 offices and how are you touching base with them, whether it's with an ask or not with an ask, mm -hmm. uh, so that you know that, you know, you're having much like you would do by simply dropping by the office, whether it's an email or a text or a phone call, you know, what are you doing to ensure that your network is still active uh, with members and staff? And so that when things do start bubbling up, you know, you have the ability to go with them, go to them and, and make that ask legislatively uh, to either help get something in or keep something out. And are, I, you, I, are you guys using like Zoom or using text, phone calls, all the above? What's the... What's so the primarily for us, like, I mean, for our team, a lot of it's uh, text with staff. Uh, uh, that's been my, uh, a lot of uh, success I found uh, because even in a virtual hearing or if they're on the phone or they're on a Zoom themselves, you know, it's pretty easy to respond to a text. It means, and by getting that response, you, you know that you've built up a good enough relationship with that staffer that they feel comfortable communicating with you in that forum. Um, Zoom is a, has been a popular one. A lot of the internal means we do Microsoft Teams. Uh, you know, so there's been a lot of video interaction with uh, members and staff. Um, and then, you know, email gets you, you know, getting documents over on uh, position papers and, you know, talking points on various issues across the board that we face. You mentioned something, again, another previous episode with David Lusk. We had one where he said, you know, don't just personalize the ask to your stakeholders on the front end, your users, your employees, et cetera. You've got to be personalizing your message to the individual offices. So one of the things you just mentioned was, you know, regular cadence to your biggest champions. Tell me a little bit more about, and you don't have to get into the details of it, but sort of the way that you're tiering the legislative offices or the way that you're grouping them together to better sort of say, here's our sort of tier one and here's our tier two. Are you doing things like that? We are. I think um, in a lot of cases for us as a pharmaceutical industry, you know, we look at, you know, who are, who are the members that are on the committees of jurisdiction? So okay. ways and means, energy and commerce, finance, uh, Senate health. Uh, and then you know, who also is going to be in the decision-making room and who in, who can influence the people that are going to be in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, so like that, that looks that looks like beyond that just the committees of jurisdiction um, and like looking what that sphere of influence is going to be and trying to help, you know, create that almost like an echo chamber so that when those decision makers are in the room, whether it be a four corners decision, whether it be a committee decision that, you know, the leadership of the committees, uh, the leadership of the parties will hear from, you know, our folks on things that are important to us and try yeah. to help, you know, get them to be in a position where they can voice those same things in the room when there's decisions being made. That's the echo chamber. The echo the, chamber, baby. Where's your, uh, ripple I, I miss, I miss, uh, I miss Blake and his, uh, his buttons here. Where I know we, can, we need uh, a little ding, ding, ding. We man. need a little yeah. ding, ding, ding on that one. I'll, um, I'll reiterate that because I think it's so important to talk about how you turn your champions into an echo chamber. Ripple advocacy. Yeah, how you go get those it. staffers to go tell other staffers about the great meeting that they had or something really interesting to magnify your message and it, it changes our our target from um quantity to quality of meeting not just dropping by and dropping off a one pager uh and hitting a bullet point or two but actually having relationships and having them help echo that i mean there's nothing more important than tiering your champions in terms of who's going to be in the committee between house and senate you know when the bill you know, gets passed and it's different and you sit down and you got to have the committees uh, sorted out, joint committee, who's in that room? I've been, I've had legislation passed and my champion was not in that room and it didn't get in. Um, it's a hard lesson to learn, but you've got to start thinking strategically about that. So I think 
So I think Michael's point on that is really well taken. Yeah, uh, agreed, absolutely. So, you know, we've talked about some of the relationship building that you've been doing and that you've done, right? And that sort of pays off now. And some of the, the tiering of those legislators, obviously they go hand in hand, right? Building relationships, making simple asks um, of, your, of, of starting those relationships to then building that up. And then sort of the echo chamber and ripple advocacy concept, I know Andy's favorite, right? But it's true, you know, the goal is to get folks back in the day when they were having the happy hour to be talking about, hey, I saw this, hey, I saw that, that was great. I love tying all our previous episodes together like this. <laughs> um, it's almost like we got a bingo card here. So we talked a little bit about, about you know, what's the, one thing I know that a lot of our corporations that we talk to and, and that work in the space, uh, just I want to hit on the pack piece just quickly and we'll, we'll circle back to everything else. But I know previously, you know, you were attending meetings with senior level executives and everyone else within the company outside of the lobbying space to talk more about the pack, to talk more about the work you were doing. How has that changed this year without these in-person meetings? How are you staying in front of PAC members? How are you doing other things of that sort? Uh, so, I mean, it's been, it's been challenging because yeah. we've had to really, of every one of our ways of working that's really become different, uh, engaging and educating employees uh, on PAC issues has probably been one of the tougher challenges. Mm. Um, it did become a little easier in the past year simply because of the election and there was a lot of interest. I mean, 159 million people turned out to vote in, in November. Uh, mm -hmm. So clearly across the board, there was just a lot of, of interest in the election. So how do we use that to uh, demonstrate why it's important to engage on the corporation side through the, the uh, political action committees? One, it was you know, educating employees on our issues. So we end up having uh, bipartisan members talk about um, things that they're seeing in Congress. Uh, and actually one really cool thing is that, you know, because uh, we're the largest uh, vaccine manufacturer globally, we got two members on a, um, on a WebEx call uh, to commit to getting the COVID vaccine together in a bipartisan way to promote va vaccine confidence. And then sure, you know, on one of their social media channels in December, sure enough, I saw a picture of those two members actually fulfilling that promise and getting the COVID vaccine. So, you know, that's, that was a good demonstration of how, you know, our engagement with elected officials has been successful. Um, but then also, you know, taking the time to, you know, look at, and we did, we've done this through a series of webinars too with our employees, or at least our entire PAC eligible class uh, at GSK. You know, we did one uh, in November, shortly after the election of, you know, here's what we know about the election at this time. Obviously there were still a lot of things that were yet to be seen, for example, the runoffs in Georgia, but what does the election mean for us? Mm -hmm. And what are some of the issues going to be in the, in the next Congress and within the now Biden administration uh, that we need to be paying close attention to? Uh, and we're gonna be doing another uh, PAC webinar for our eligible class uh, in early March, really focused on you know, what's going on, what's been going on in the first 100 days so far, not, not only at the federal level, but also at the state level, because there's a lot of activity uh, in the pharmaceutical space in state capitals across the country as well. So kind of trying to just make this a, a big educational campaign uh, and continuing to demonstrate to our, our PAC members, our PAC eligibles, um, the importance of why we engage uh, and how that benefits our company and our patients. Uh, I love it, I love it. Um, you know, one of the things uh, just quickly, uh, you know, last week was the advocacy conference. Fantastic. Great job of walking it through. Um, they had Jay Timmons on from the National Association of Manufacturing, and he talked about policy, not people. Can you give us a little bit just on, on how you kind of push that with your uh, with your advocacy, with your PAC efforts of it? It's about the policy that these politicians make, not about them themselves, not about any of the other details. We're here to work on the issues that matter to us. And I think, yes, that's exactly correct. I think Jay was was absolutely correct there. And I think the way that we look at it, um, you know, my, my boss has said this, you know, a, a thousand times, and I completely agree with him that, you know, our issues within the pharmaceutical space are too big and too important for just one party to address. Uh, we have to be looking at how both Republicans and Democrats are in a position to be thoughtful uh, and to engage appropriately on advancing patient-centered solutions within the healthcare system. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And I know that, Andy, you deal with the same thing. I mean, how is it that you speak to some of your folks when you get this pushback of, 
well, you know, we're never going to get this person or we just don't care about that person is how is do you sort of say, look, it's about the policy of, in your case, you know, strong trade, strong, strong footwear, strong manufacturing, et cetera. How, how are you bringing that to life? Yeah, it's a benefit to have worked on the Hill in this example, because you fall back into technical language. There is a political language and there is a technical government language and you fall back into your government language to speak to them strictly about policy. Uh, sometimes you use big words, <laughs> big phrases about processes, not to show it off, but to bring their mind back to the point that anybody can use political rhetoric to, to ramp people up and fire people up. The question then becomes, how do you talk about your strategy and talk about the policy and the outcomes you're looking for, um, both in terms of what your champions are and your, your membership roles, how you get common members on if you're getting a bill through, co-sponsors, how you get it through committee, um, how you get it to the floor. Like these are the things that, it, you know, this is, you know, and I want to bring Michael on this too and get his opinion on this, but this really becomes a question of, is your association doing legacy PR legislation? Meaning, are you introducing the same bill every single year, knowing it's not going to pass? In the long term, it's probably going to damage your reputation with your members signing up, thinking these guys can't get anything done. But is it the same thing year over year over year? Are you trying something a little bit different? Are you being more strategic? Are you finding better ways to get it passed? Um, and also, I think, you know, there's so many people in advocacy that don't really know how to get a bill passed. They think there's a traditional model that you go, there's not, there's a book way to do it. And there's a not, there's a, there's a secret passage as we all know through the Capitol having worked there. Um, how about, I, you know, I'll bring you on this too, because I know you've, you've been an expert in terms of committee work and process and all that. What are, you know, when you think about this stuff, and you talk about your folks, do you guys get more technical and, and strip out who these people are and just get to the base level? And then also, what are strategies around actually passing legislation? Generally, not just GSK, but generally that people can think about. Yeah. Well, I think one is that from a lobbying perspective, I think you know a lot of us fall into a trap of thinking that we can just push the right bill, the right answer, um, the right policy uh, to staff, to elected officials. I think one time, in a lot of cases, what we need to be thinking about instead is what's the problem that the elected officials are trying to solve, both from a policy and political standpoint? Because, I mean, in a vacuum, yes, policy is great, but we also have to understand the political realities of the environment, too. So how can we sometimes tailor our approach to identify the problem they're trying to solve and help them solve it? Mm. That's a great point. I think yeah. It's really well taken because yeah. it, it, is, it is a holistic approach, right? Like you've got to you do need good policy, but you also need the good politics behind it to get it to get it through and understand all the different variants. Um, but what about if somebody is sitting there thinking about passing legislation? Some of the some of the terms that come to mind, and people may not be cognizant of these things at all. But suspension calendar, manager's amendment. Can you talk a little bit about those? Sure. I mean, yeah. Anytime you're on suspension, that's a that's an easy fly-in day. That means. Uh, You've done something right through the committee process, through um, uh, you know, in your work leading up to that point to uh, deliver a pretty easy win. Uh, and we forget that sometimes suspension, the suspension calendar is, is not just for naming post offices or technical amendments. I mean, we saw in 2017 uh, the prescription drug user fee uh, package, the PDUFA uh, bill go through under suspension and pass unanimously. I mean, that's a pretty, that's a highly technical piece of FDA legislation. And so the fact that, you know, through the committee process uh, and even before the committee process in the hearings, uh, in engaging the FDA with members, uh, understanding what the priorities are and being able to get something like that on suspension, I mean, that's a massive win. And that's something that impacts all of our lives. Um, but, you know, it's not sexy enough to be um, political banter because it's a ma massively bipartisan outcome. Um, you know, managers amendments. I mean, what what work are you doing behind the scenes, particularly before a committee markup uh, or even you know floor consideration, to get into a managers amendment? That you know you've you've cleared things in a bipartisan way. Who have you built up? Let's you know use a committee here for as an example. Who have you built up on both sides of the dais uh, so that the chairman, whenever he or she you know brings forward that manager's amendment, how is your provision in there or how are you able to get your provision in there so that 
you know, sometimes the best things are the things that aren't discussed. Amen. <laughs> I like it. I like Tricks it. Tricks of the no, trade look, right I, there, folks. I think you're, you're, you know, it's, it, this is what I like about, about the advocacy help desk is, is we all learn different things at different times and we all take different approaches. And I think that, you know, uh, Andy, you're right. A lot of folks take a, a traditional look at it. And especially this is our job to help those folks not in the advocacy space better understand how bills are passed. Cause I know that a lot of, a lot of associations, a lot of corporations are struggling with that right now because, you know, I heard this at the conference again, folks are like, well, we got our bill introduced and now it's going to pass in 30 days, right? Isn't that how this whole thing works? And, and so they're having to educate their own people on these types of moves, not just for themselves and, and getting their own bills passed, but so that they're, they don't see a revolt of their own folks who come back and say, well, why isn't our bill passed? It's been 60 days or it's been 90 days. And, and I'm not going to keep supporting you if we don't do this. So there's a lot of communication. Can you talk a little bit about that communication that you're doing with your uh, both PAC folks as well as your grassroots folks on on how a bill is passed. I'm not talking schoolhouse rock style, but I just mean like, you know, are you you're communicating both wins, losses, status? Uh, how does that whole process work, or what are you thinking about when you're doing it? Uh, kind of all of the above. I mean, you know, thinking about it from a business perspective and how you know how is a particular piece of legislation or potentially a budget offset. Um, viewed from a business perspective and how is it going to impact, you know, your company, whatever that company may be, pharmaceutical, et cetera. Um, what's out there, what's going to impact your company in either a positive or negative way and making sure you're communicating that information in real time to the business stakeholders that need to hear it. Um, you know, does everyone need to hear it? Probably not. But the ones that, you know, are decision makers internally are the ones that need to hear that and, and you know, continue seeing that your engagement with your customers, and in this case, the elected officials, that you're providing value back to the company uh, in moving the needle and in influencing legislation. Yeah. Transparency and trust, I think, is the key, right? Yeah. Like always being transparent about what's happening, explain. Some people forget. I mean, this is, I don't know how many years ago this was, but CRS did this whole report about how long it takes for a bill to become law, like a basic non-political bill it takes about this is back before there you know we got really aggressive on on political side on the capitol hill this is just normal politics it took six years because yep. you have to educate staff you have to have those staff stay around long enough to where you can educate other people and not have to go back to that office where the staff are left and re-educate all over again the member has to hear it 20 times for it to stick and not feel like there's something threatening that was a normal age. So I don't you know, today it's a, it's a lot harder to think in those terms, but I think we have to explain that for sure to our members and, and, and explain processes and how long it takes and what the win looks like. And, you know, at the very beginning, Calvo talked about relationships. You don't ramp up a relationship in 30 days. I mean, it's just impossible. You have to have, you have to be around the basket waiting for rebounds um, you know, you have, you have to be, you have to be around and you have to be ready for opportunities. I mean, I've seen, you know, in Congress over my, you know, working there and then outside for, you know, doing, doing this for over 20 years now, God forbid. Um, you would look at and you would say nothing's ever going to happen on this thing. And tw two weeks later, boom, like something starts to move politics shift. There's a lot of tectonic plates and we're like, nothing moves for a long time. Then all of a sudden you have an earthquake. So you know, if you're not there, you got to explain that to your members. If you're not there, someone else is. Um, and someone else is telling the story you need to tell. And, uh, you know, it's hard to get a lot of wins these days, but sometimes the win is just making sure that people know you're there so that if the earthquake happens, you can take advantage. Yeah. I mean, I think there's an element to being nimble um, from both the staff perspective. I mean, you know, you and I have both have done this where, um, something happens and you said you have to fundamentally change the strategy yeah. uh, for your boss to be able to try to find a path to success. Yeah. Now that happens on the lobbying side too. Um, sometimes you have to change your strategy multiple times uh, and simply adapt to, you know, what cards are being dealt to you on the table. Yeah. How are you guys, um, how do you guys prioritize your intelligence gathering and how do you, how do you know what to tell your executives and how do you, you know, cause obviously you guys are at state level, you're at federal level. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm sure, you know, you guys have a team that go out and, and talk to people and take all that information back and, and, and filter that and figure out what's happening strategically. 
Um, and I'm guessing you use associations as well to help feed that information in. How do you, you know, it's the, in the same way as a Hill staff are having all this information coming, what's, how do you create the nuggets of gold from all the stuff that's out there? How do you, how do you create, how do you find the signal and all the noise that you really need to tell your executives? Well, I think for us, it's making the determination and using an ana- you know, a pretty bare bones analogy here, what's smoke and what's fire. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sifting through what the smoke is because there's going to be a lot of that uh, across the board. And then what are the things that, are, that have a direct impact either positively or negatively for your company or your association is what you need, you know, what you think is actually going to be real and actionable are the things that immediately need to get reported up. Uh, and then, you know, sifting through the smoke and reporting, reporting up what is needed out of there if some of it begins to materialize. I mean, you see that elsewhere too. I, I think that that's a great way to put it. And and this is another one where you're bringing sort of, I don't want to say marketing tactics, but you're bringing that mind to it of, you know, here's what we're tracking and here's what we're listening to, or here's what we're reading outside of this, right? Which is, here's the important, but it, it's, you know, uh, for lack of better terms, it's like an Axio style of, 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 of writing. It's, it's that kind of concept of here's the smart brevity. Here are the three or four things you need to know. And then here are the three or four things that we're watching that you don't really need to know about right now, but you should at least keep on your radar. And so that's sort of the approach that, that you guys are talking about. I know Andy, you do that with, uh, we're jumping everywhere here, but with the podcast as well as just saying, breaking down some of those barriers, let's talk through this topic right now. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. important. You need, you need your long form, you need your short form, you need diversity of, of flow because people consume, your content differently. I mean, you know, so many times in advocacy, people try to be so technical and create these technical things and send out technical bullet points with Washington language. And it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Some people like that, you know, if they're, if they're technical or they're, you know, math people or chemistry people are like, you know, some kind of technical mind that has that consume those reports really well, but then you got marketing and sales that need a picture mm-hmm. and they need a story uh, cause that's how they think and that's how they sell. So you know, I think in advocacy, that's the challenge is like how we take all our stuff and put stories together, channel in different channels, have those different conversations, um, you know, and it's, it's a challenge. I mean, it's super easy to come out with one, one, one pager and be like, this is it. And we're going to do a webinar and this is it, you know, but everybody's at different levels and at different ways. And, right. and, you know, it all, you know, Brian, you, you do really well to remind people advocacy is all about storytelling. Um, and if we're not telling the story with the data and we're not sharing somebody's personal life being impacted, then you're never going to have an emotional connection to build relationships and move the dial. Yeah. Um, I've never seen data move anything in a meeting. Uh, I've only seen data move the staffer to be like, all right, the meeting's up. I've got to go. <laughs> I mean, look, let me interrupt you there. I mean, yes, there is the quote or the line that says, you know, you don't tell your, your kids a midnight data, right? At the same time, I mean, I, I would, but you know, that's just me because I'm a nerd. But um, I, I get it. it. It is a combination of the yeah, two you need both. Bringing it all together. Sure. Yeah, you absolutely need both. And I also think, just to kind of jump in as well, I think who is the carrier of that message? I mean, sometimes mm-hmm. you know, getting outside expert voices to help carry your message sometimes is more impactful than you doing it as an association, you doing it as a company, Very true. Um, where with voices that have credibility for your audience. Right. Um, whether that be think tank, whether that be, um, you know, a 501 C4 or whomever, uh, sometimes, you know, it's best for you to help enable a different messenger to be able to convey your story and your objectives, uh, because that audience just may find it more credible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that kicks back to another episode we had where we talked about, you know, finding the right messenger for the right office with the right message so that you can really hit home. And, and in your case, it may be that patient who received one of your therapeutics or that employee that helped develop that therapeutic. So both sides of the coin where you then have, you know, the, the, the message to, hey, we did this work in your district and here's who we helped and here's why I love doing this work and here's what it means to us and the world and the country help us get that message across to everyone else because that's what we want to do. Hey, I know you're, uh, you're managing a uh, very diverse team, you know, and right now we're all over the place. We're working from home. Some people are in office, you know, we don't know when people are going to be willing to go back. If they're going to get back, how are you looking at operationally uh, running a GR shop at a corporation? What's the, I mean, obviously, cause at some associations we can kind of pick and choose how we want to run things. 
corporate sometimes may push down certain rules and regulations. How are you guys looking at returning back to the office, you know, timetables? Are you going to be more flexible with work-life balance time for your staff? You know, what's that, what's that look like going forward? Well, I think the, the one thing that we've done, and I think we've done a good job about this over the past now 11 months is that, you know, these are really crazy chaotic times and that each individual on our team has got different circumstances, different responsibilities with family, potentially with children that may be uh, virtual learning. So what we've been trying to do is, is convey to the folks on our team the maximum amount of flexibility that they have to, you know, be uh, to, to get their work done and achieve their objectives, but also to, so they have the ability to, you know, be with their family, be with loved ones, you know, help educate kids at home. Uh, so one thing that we've, we've tried to do is, is instill continuously that we want to make sure that folks on our team have the right, uh, not the right, we have maximum amount of flexibility uh, to be able to, you know, get through this. I think that's, that's the one way of saying this. Uh, yeah. And then for me personally, one of the things that, you know, I've been trying to read um, a variety of different um, articles on uh, management tools. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of the things you see, like just simply implementing, you know, the emotional intelligence to understand what's going on with, with everyone on your team. And sometimes that's as easy as just asking them in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, how are you doing? Yeah. Um, how are you holding up? How's your family? Uh, to know that, you know, there, there is life that exists outside of our jobs and to recognize that while we're all working from home, that that's a, ma that's a major point of, of getting through the pandemic and being understanding of each individual circumstances um, so that um, you know, they feel like they're being respected, uh, that their contributions are valued, but then also more importantly, that they're valued as human beings as part of the team. Hmm. Let me add, we have a lot of people who listen to our show who are just getting into advocacy or just mid-tier advocacy and they have, you know, some of them have large bureaucracy above them, some have one person, you know, et cetera. How as a person on the lower rung of, of an association just starting off, how do you talk to your boss about that if you're struggling? I mean, is it, is it as simple as just pulling them aside and being open and honest at what's happening and what you need? I mean, because I feel like sometimes um, younger people in advocacy or in GR are afraid that if they mention they're having a challenge, then that, that's, a, that's a hit against their reputation internally. How would you advise somebody on that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it is, you know, the courage to have that open, honest conversation, um, at least if that were me on the receiving end of that. Um, because, you know, I think everyone's struggling in their own specific way right now, whether it's, um, you know, I mean, everyone wants to not be in the pandemic. Mm. Uh, and so everyone has their own individual struggle and, and, you know, identifying the courage that's taken that person to be willing to talk about it whether that be a, a professional struggle that they're seeing, that's something that's impeding them from, you know, meeting an objective. Yeah, that's, that's great. Let's talk about that. So we can think about a new strategy that will help you, um, you know, navigate the environment, uh, whether it's a, a personal thing that, you know, listen, I may need to take an extra day or so to deal with fill in the blank. Um, having the courage to talk about those things for me as a manager, I think that that's, that's something that's, that's commendable. I like that. I like that. Michael, we have talked about, whew, I have a page full of things that are going in six different directions. Here. So, connect the dots. La, 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 la. Uh, I want to finish with, will City lose another game and are they going to run away with the table or not? Oh my God. Oh. I've lost Cork and he's done. Ha. I kid. I kid. Um, I was going to say, I mean, that's a... I know. It depends um, on how, how Pep's feeling these days. Mr. Mr. Calvo, no, uh, honestly, I appreciate this. I uh, reserve the right to recall the witness at a later date. Uh, there's a lot that you've given us today in terms of relationship building, in terms of sort of, uh, it's been a great insight into both your experience and some of the work that you're doing now. Um, just everything from as, as, you know, operations to approach to pack to communications to everything else. So uh, yes, we really, really appreciate you being with us today um, and talking about all these different things. And I absolutely want to get you back on the show, say six months from now or a year from now, even to talk through, okay, great. As we have hopefully vaccinated and gotten to a place where we're back in the office, we're back doing things differently, et cetera. 
um, how has that changed? How has that, how has that gotten better? What, what's, what's been better? What's been worse? So want to have you back on, but just wanted to thank you for joining us today and all the various things that we've just touched on. And Polk knows this is going to be a heck of a write-up for me, but it, it you know, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. So, Mr. Yep, Polk, yep. please. Yep. Calvo, thank you very much. And folks, as always, advocacyhelpdesk.com is the website. Our full catalog is there. We're also uh, on every single audio platform out there. So whether it's Apple, Spotify, uh, you know, Google, I don't know if Google has one, but Google, whatever it is, we're there. So however you, however you consume podcast content, we are there. We want to thank uh, the audience for consistently growing. We're at, you know, upwards of 200 people per episode now. For our industry, that's huge, actually, because if you think about how many people are in advocacy and GR, it's still a relatively small number. We think it's a big number, but it's still relatively small. And uh, we hope you will share this episode out. We hope you will tell people about it. We hope you subscribe and keep listening. If you have ideas for guests or topics that we need to talk about, drop us a line, advocacyhelpdesk.com. Um, so with that, you know, again, Michael Calvo, GSK, thank you very much for sharing your mission, uh, the work you do, really good insights and strategy, really good insights into, um, you know, how you're operating in this day, just like Fracken said. I mean, those, those conversations are just as important as what we're talking about, about changing little tools and tactics here and there. It's really about the culture that we're, we're building in our advocacy program to pull people into our advocacy program and also preach it towards uh, whatever legislative body you're preaching it towards. So with that, I hope you keep preaching. Um, I hope you stay safe, wear your masks, 12 feet. I'm doubling up. Uh, they say double mask, why not double up to you? Uh, soon, obviously, Help Desk will have a happy hour in the future. I'm not saying what date. Every every guest that we've had on will be there. We hope all our audience will be there too. Drinks will be on fracking. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Classic. Maybe. <laughs> Classic. Classic. Oh, Paul. There you go. All right, folks. Uh, be safe again. Please be safe. Please be healthy. Please get your shot. And please keep advocating. We're out. <laughs>